communion debate. U.S. bishops consider the importance of the Eucharist and whether or not pro-abortion politicians should receive it. Summit in Switzerland. President Joe Biden and President Vladimir Putin discuss some of the thorniest issues facing the world today. Protecting the Hyde Amendment. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin agrees to prevent federal funding of abortions. And violence in the Holy Land. The fragile ceasefire in Israel is interrupted with an explosive attack. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops began its spring meeting today. A key question is whether the bishops will commission a document regarding the Holy Eucharist. You desire justice for all. Enable us to uphold the rights of others. Do not allow us to be misled by ignorance or corrupted by fear or favor. Unite us to yourself in the bond of love and keep us faithful to all that is true. Thank you for joining us. Any proposed draft on the meaning the of the Eucharist the would likely not appear for consideration time. until next fall when the USCCB plans to reconvene in Baltimore. And joining us now to talk more about the General Assembly is Bishop Thomas Pabrocki from the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. Your Excellency, welcome back. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, as we mentioned, today is the first day. Uh, what items were discussed and, and how are the meetings going so far? Well, we got off to a rather unusual start. We spent the first hour uh, approving the agenda, uh, and that normally takes about 30 seconds. Uh, but there was a motion by Archbishop Mitchell Rosansky of St. Louis that was seconded by Cardinal Tobin of Newark, uh, proposing that when we get to the agenda item on Eucharistic coherence that the doctrine uh, committee that is working on, that there be unlimited discussion, that every bishop be given the opportunity to speak. Well, we've got uh, over 300 bishops on, on that call, and... Uh, that would amount pretty much to uh, an Episcopal filibuster to, to just keep talking about that issue. And, and so even the debate on whether or not to, uh, to approve that motion uh, took up a, almost a full hour, and then it, it got voted down. Mm. So that uh, motion failed, and we will, we will have our discussion then uh, later in the agenda, towards the end of the agenda, to talk about the proposed uh, uh, statement or the doctrine uh, committee that the doctrine committee is working on. Well, speaking of that discussion tomorrow on Eucharistic coherence or the importance of communion to the life of the church, tell us why that topic is so important, especially now. Well, what we see uh, is that uh, the question is uh, uh, certainly prompted. The urgency of the question is the fact that uh, President Biden and other uh, Catholic politicians are uh, taking a, a position that is very contrary to church teaching, especially with regard to uh, marriage and transgender issues, issues and same-sex marriage and pro-life issues. Uh, and, and so uh, that's just one issue, but we're also seeing the question that uh, we really want to address the uh, whole understanding that people have of the Eucharist, uh, uh, that uh, uh, do people really understand what uh, the church teaches about the Eucharist and our own actions must be consistent with the way uh, we live our, li our lives, our faith, our actions must be consistent with each other. And so it's, it's an important issue, not just for politicians, but actually for every Catholic to really look at what we uh, understand by the Eucharist. Yeah. And as far as the General Assembly, what are you personally looking forward to the most? Uh, what are the issues that are, are really on top of mind for you? Well, that's a very important issue, uh, but there are other issues that we are, we'll be looking at as well. There are a number of translations of documents, for example. We've been working for several years on a new translation of the uh, Liturgy of the Hours, the, uh, the divine office that uh, clergy and religious uh, pray every day. And uh, so we're getting to the last uh, stages of that, so hopefully we'll get uh, that uh, document approved, those translations uh, approved. And then also there's a document on the... Um, uh, a draft of a pastoral framework on marriage and family life, and that's another issue that's uh, uh, very pressing for us today in our world. So uh, I think there's other issues that we have to look at in addition to the question of uh, uh, Eucharistic coherence. 
And before I let, let you go, Your Excellency, is there any indication on if or when the meetings will return uh, in person? And what are your thoughts about that gathering in person compared to virtually? Well, I, our, the plan is that we'll be back in person in November at our uh, Baltimore meeting. Uh, and we normally meet twice a year, so the June meeting and the, and the November meeting. Uh, this meeting is still being done by Zoom. And uh, yes, it's uh, it, it makes for some awkwardness and uh, always the, the challenge of uh, speakers not unmuting their microphones and things like that. P plus, there's the additional factor that... Uh, uh, we, we can do the official business over Zoom, but there's the the unofficial conversations that take place uh, during the breaks and uh, during uh, meals uh, where you can discuss a lot of things informally, and that simply is not possible over Zoom. Yeah, it certainly can be a challenge. I know we've all experienced this uh, during the pandemic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Your Excellency. We always appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. God bless you. And coming up later in the newscast, analysis of the first day from Dr. Matthew Bunsen, executive editor and Washington bureau chief for EWTN News. Our President Joe Biden says that he thinks that there is a genuine prospect to significantly improve the relationships between the United States and Russia. And that's what he told reporters after meeting face to face with Russian President Vladimir Putin today in Geneva. When asked if he trusts the Russian leader, President Biden said it's not about trust and that, quote, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. White House correspondent Owen Jensen tells us what came out of their highly anticipated summit. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. President Biden is on his way back to the White House tonight. Now, he just spent several days in Europe, of course, attending multiple summits. And by far, the summit that drew the most intense scrutiny played out today. In Geneva, the Swiss president welcoming U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian leader Vladimir Putin, who shake hands and later sit down to start their talks. Near them, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and a translator for each side. Well, thank you. As I said outside, I think it's always better to make face to face. What was expected to last four to five hours turned out to be less than three. After that, each holding their own individual news conference, President Putin going first, followed by President Biden, who told reporters, I told President Putin my agenda is not against Russia or anyone else. It's for the American people. And President Biden also made one issue very clear. So human rights is going to always be on the table, I told him. It's not about just going after Russia when they violate human rights. It's about who we are. That's why we're going to raise our concerns about cases like Alexei Navalny. President Putin acknowledged that President Biden raised human rights issues with him and added Alexei Navalny had ignored Russia's laws. Overall, President Putin called the talks well-balanced and constructive and says he and President Biden agreed to begin negotiations on limiting nuclear weapons. President Biden has taken on responsibility and has taken the decision, which we believe is quite timely, to extend the START Treaty for five years. In addition, President Putin said he and President Biden agreed to return their ambassadors to their posts, earlier polled when relations soured. They will be returning to service, the permanent service, but when specifically it'll be tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, that's a mere technical issue. Now, President Biden also said that he brought up the two cases of Americans he says are wrongfully imprisoned in Russia, talking about Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed, and he promised he will not walk away from that. And on cybersecurity, President Biden said certain critical infrastructure has to be off limits, including water and energy. And President Putin, for his part, insists his country has nothing to do with the cyber intrusions. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Uh, with a razor-thin Democratic majority in the Senate, neither side can afford to lose support from infrastructure spending to so-called voting reform. West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin says that he continues to support the Hyde Amendment, which could have an effect on the passing of future spending bills. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric. A lifelong Catholic, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin tells me that he's always been pro-life. And despite getting pressure from progressives in his own party, he tells me that he believes federal funds should not be used to fund abortions anywhere in the country. 
I'm a, I support the Hyde Amendment. I've always supported the Hyde Amendment. I don't know how many times I have to tell you that. The West Virginia senator is one of only a few congressional Democrats who have expressed support for the measure, which bans almost all federal funding of abortions. The policy is not permanent law and must be attached to individual appropriation bills to take effect. Two other Democratic senators, Bob Casey and Tim Kaine, also support Hyde. The way we respect everybody's point of view is we make sure that um, we don't pass laws that restrict people's constitutional rights, but also we don't take the tax dollars of those who are opposed to abortion and use them for abortion. So that's why I've always been a Hyde Amendment supporter. You may recall in 2019, then-candidate Biden said that he could no longer continue to abide by the Hyde Amendment. I asked House Minority Whip Steve Scalise about Biden's change policy and why pro-life Democrats are not speaking up. Well, you haven't seen any pro-life Democrats on the House side. The Minority Whip gave the example of the recent Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which would require a doctor to treat a baby who survives an abortion. The congressman says he can't get any support across the aisle for this bill. Not a single Democrat will sign on to that discharge petition. So I don't know how anybody can call themselves pro-life and not demand that the Born Alive Act come to the House floor. Pro-life groups, including the U.S. Bishops Conference, warn without abortion funding restrictions, billions of dollars in health care funds could go to abortion providers and abortion coverage. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. A new round of armed clashes have flared up between Israel and Hamas militants in Gaza. A march by Israeli ultra-nationalists prompted a retaliation by suspected Hamas militants. Israel responded with a new round of airstrikes. No casualties have been reported. A ceasefire was reached last month. Israel is welcoming a benchmark of its successful coronavirus vaccine campaign. Those who are vaccinated no longer have to wear masks indoors. However, there are some exceptions, including when visiting the sick or traveling by airplane. Israel has vaccinated nearly 85 percent of its adult population. Iran's outgoing president is calling on his nation to vote in Friday's election. President Hassan Rouhani is not on the ballot due to term limits, but he urged participation, even with the country reeling from U.S. economic sanctions compounded by recent surge in coronavirus infections. Hardline Judiciary Chief Ibrahim Raisi is favored with support from Iran's supreme leader. After several weeks of an overwhelming rise in COVID-19 cases, India is welcoming a hopeful sign with the reopening of its famed Taj Mahal. Access will be limited with safety precautions in place. India reported 62,000 new infections in the past day. That is down from a daily peak of 400,000 in April when the Taj Mahal was closed. COVID-19 has claimed nearly 380,000 lives in India. Coming up... In the midst of a critical Supreme Court case, learn how some wealthy donors are working against religious freedom. And get your analysis of today's USCCB meeting, what you should know about the bishop's priorities. Well, ahead of a much-anticipated Supreme Court ruling on a Catholic adoption agency, donors are pouring millions of dollars to groups that oppose broad religious freedom protections. The move comes as the nation's highest court considers whether local anti-discrimination ordinances can effectively close Catholic adoption agencies. And for more on this story, including a look at the amount of money being contributed to anti-religious freedom groups, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. Well, as we reported earlier, today is the opening of the USCCB General Assembly, and tomorrow is expected to be the much-anticipated debate on the importance of the Eucharist. Joining us now for analysis is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, executive editor and Washington bureau chief for EWTN News. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Always great to be with you. First off, your impressions of opening day. 
Well, we had uh, been heading into this uh, meeting of the bishops, a virtual meeting, of course, uh, with uh, the question of how the bishops are going to grapple with the question of Eucharistic coherence, Eucharistic consistency. There has been for months a debate among many of the bishops, including a, a faction of the bishops who are really apparently opposed to any discussion of this. And we were wondering whether this was going to play out and how dramatically at this meeting. Well, after the first day, we can see very dramatically. Uh, it took them an hour, essentially, today simply to get the agenda approved for the discussions at this meeting. Uh, there was a parliamentary effort to block, uh, basically, the discussion by trying to open up everything to every bishop weighing in on the question of the Eucharist uh, before they have any other further discussion on that this question of are we going to have a draft document approved uh, for, to be written. Uh, so the, the complications uh, that we saw playing out today, I think, are uh, in giving us a very good sense that this is going to be a rough couple of days uh, with potentially a lot more fireworks to come. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, how do you think that is going to affect the next couple of days, and do you think anything will really be accomplished? Oh, I think uh, Archbishop Gomez, the president of the USCCB, had a, a game plan going in. It was very clear. Uh, he for example, quoted a letter from Archbishop Augustine de Noya, an official of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, saying essentially that we are looking forward to previewing and, and, and reviewing uh, the document that is eventually going to be uh, drafted by the conference. Uh, so we have that sort of a, a green light from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith for the bishops to move forward with this. And as we saw, the, the motions to try to delay a discussion were defeated. So the debate will go on tomorrow, as expected. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also uh, creating an atmosphere, I think, of at least apparent disunity among the bishops, and is likely to overshadow some of the other more important discussions, or equally important discussions, that the bishops are going to try to grapple with over the next few days. Yeah, and the discussion, of course, on the importance of the Eucharist supposing to take place tomorrow. Um, talk about the timing of that, and why the debate is happening, and why you think that's important? Well, the debate is happening uh, for two reasons. Uh, we have uh, a Catholic president in President Joe Biden uh, who announces that he is a devout Catholic, but who is also clearly and openly and obdurately and obstinately uh, dissenting from church teaching on a number of important areas, the most important of which, the preeminent one, is on abortion. Uh, so the bishops recognize that this is a, a crisis for American Catholicism that has to be remedied, it has to be looked at. Uh, and so they're, they, they're trying to create a document on Eucharistic coherence and consistency. There's no vote intended uh, to deny Joe Biden uh, the, the Eucharist. But at the same time, the bishops also recognize the need uh, to deal with the fact uh, that 50 percent of Catholics today do not believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. Uh, this is a challenge for us, as we discovered in our own EWTN Real Clear Opinion Research poll last year. Uh, this is a catechetical crisis for us as well. The two are connected, uh, but the bishops also know that this is a program of Eucharistic revival that we need to have. And how do you see this playing out? Well, I think uh, the debates are going to go forward, uh, and we'll know a lot more tomorrow uh, in terms of the tenor of the debate surrounding the proposal uh, to approve the drafting of a document. Let's remember what we're actually talking about here. I look forward to the presentation from Bishop Kevin Rhodes, who's the head of the Doctrine Committee. I think he has a very clear idea of what this document needs to be and what it really is in terms of Eucharistic coherence. Eucharistic consistency. And Matthew, before I let you go, what else do you have your eye on when it comes to the meetings? Well, there are a couple of important items. Uh, one is a pastoral framework uh, for family life. The other is a, a similar pastoral framework for youth ministry. But then there's also going to be uh, the discussion about a statement and a vision document for evangelization and ministry to Native Americans, uh, given some of the recent news uh, that we saw coming out of Canada and the long-standing challenges of, of really helping to provide ministry and pastoral care for Native Americans. I think this is going to be an important watershed moment, and I hope it's not overshadowed too greatly uh, by what we saw today. And any last thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, let's keep praying for our bishops. Uh, they have a, a rough job as it is. Uh, and at this moment, I think coming together in this moment uh, to deal with the question of the Eucharist uh, is something that all of us uh, need to be praying on, but all of us need also to be aware of the Eucharist in our own lives and to make ourselves worthy to receive the sacrament, which goes to the very heart, I think, of some of this discussion. Well, Dr. Bunsen, thank you so much for weighing in for us. We always appreciate your analysis. Good to be with you. Up next. Vatican Communication, the push to help young journalists navigate the digital world. 
Sad pilgrims gather to hear the Holy Father, why he says we're never alone. A Vatican Department recently offered a course to more than a dozen young communications employees from all over the world. Faith communication in the digital world was an initiative of the Vatican Dicastery for Communication. Its goal was to help the young employees develop good practices to better respond to the challenges of their mission. Joining us now is one of the 16 young workers who took part in that training. Maribel Mayorga is web content manager for the Diocese of Montreal. Maribel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I understand that you were at the Vatican last week. Can you tell us more about this course and how you were able to take part in it? Actually, uh, thank you first, uh, first of all for inviting me. So the Dicastery of Communication, they built this huge project called Faith Communication in the Digital World. So how do we can bring this Catholic faith into the digital world? And um, so it was, this was a global contest. At first they were trying to, you know, choose 10 young communicators around the world, but because of the many applications, they decided to take 16 of them. And um, I got chosen from Canada. I'm the only one from Canada. And I'm really excited. I'm, I'm so proud of this because, you know, since February, we're working together every Saturday. We're receiving this vocational training. And um, and last week, like you said, last week we were there in Rome trying to, you know, embrace this, uh, all this learning that we have to, we have to learn on how can we communicate our faith well into the digital world. What an honor, and also another big honor. I heard that uh, during the days of the Vatican, you met Pope Francis. Uh, talk yeah. to us about that amazing experience. I mean, this was a, a beautiful experience. Of course, we're all happy and excited, but he said one sentence really important, and he said, pray for me, not against me. Well, which, like, at first we laugh, of course, because obviously we're not going to pray against you. But then when you step back a little bit, you realize how that sentence was so important. As young communicators, we don't want to proclaim and put our there like something against our Catholic faith. We have to promote well with the right tools. And how do we do that? First, we learn the ba the basics. We have to learn also about our faith a little bit more, and then after use the right tool to put it out there into the digital world. Yeah, what a great experience! I'm I'm sure you'll always remember that. Uh, what's the next step? in the project for you. Uh, we understand that you may be back in Rome at some point. Also, I'm curious, um, what were your big takeaways from it? So, first of all, the next step, because I know there's a lot more that they don't want to tell us, but the next step that we know is to work on the four uh, pontifical basilicas in Rome. So there's four of them. That's why we were there last week. Mm -hmm. um, and then put all of that, all that learning into maybe a website, into a microsite, anything that goes to the digital world. We want to bring an experience to anyone who cannot be there physically, but they can look through here into the through the media, through the internet. And I was so happy, you know, because this is it now, you know, we're 2021. <laughs> Once you be in the digital world. And uh, I'm so happy because this initiative from the Dicastery of Communication um, is bringing a lot of, of good um, uh, of good of good points. I mean, this is so important right now. You know, people are in need, especially with the situation that we're living right now because of this pandemic. People are in need, you know, to feel connected, to feel um, to feel that they they belong somewhere. And we have to accompany these people, you know, through their faith journey. And this is like. A better way, you know, through the digital world, uh, to be present for them, to accompany them. So I'm really happy to be there. I'm really excited for what is going on after, and uh, and also I'm really really happy because we have some uh, beautiful colleagues and teams here that uh, that are the same. They feel the same thing as me. Maribel, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us, and congratulations again. What an incredible experience. Maribel Mayorga, thank you so much. you're welcome. Web content manager for the Diocese of Montreal. Thank you again. Thank you. And finally tonight, Pope Francis reminds the faithful that even when dying on the cross, Jesus prayed for every single one of us. In lui non c'è solamente la bontà, c'è qualcosa di più, c'è la salvezza.
Sarah's weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican. The Holy Father says even in our darkest time and worst suffering, we are never alone. Pope Francis also says he received grace through our own prayers and those of Christ on our behalf. Well, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.